My name is Stephen Kepos. Um, Hungarian name for Stephen is Istvan, but in, in the UK I call myself Stephen. Born in Budapest in 1937. My father um, was a doctor, um, initially a GP in a small place uh, close to Budapest. And later, uh, while, while working as a GP, he also trained further and qualified as a, as a psychoanalyst. His father, my grandfather, whom I never knew, um, was um, working for um, a synagogue as a cantor. And um, obviously he and his wife, my grandmother, both religious Jews. Um, my father, on the other hand, uh, sort of re reacted against that and he was um, an out-and-out -out atheist, um, really, and um, completely secular. I had no uh, upbringing in Jewish tradition. My mother um, comes from a well-off family. Um, they were um, landowners, also a Jewish family, and owners of um, a state of land and forests in, um, and, uh, uh, in, in uh, Transylvania, not far from Cluj-Napoca um, in Hungarian Kolosvar, who, which was and still regarded as perhaps the capital of Transylvania. It's quite an important, nice town. I brought along this book, which is an album um, we created as a family. Uh, on the occasion of my aunt Zelma, who, who was part of the rescue group in, during the war, her hundredth birthday. But I drew a kind of a decorative family tree on the cover. Holocaust victim, Holocaust victim. Uh, Holocaust victim, Holocaust victim, Holocaust victim. Holocaust victim, Holocaust victim, Holocaust victim. Quite a lot. When I started schooling, it was compulsory to have religious education and I did start very briefly um, to, to go to uh, Jewish uh, religious classes and I was beginning to struggling with Hebrew and then it was all stopped when Jews weren't allowed to go to school uh, after the German occupation. And um, the war having reached Hungary in 43, really. Um, but the Hungarian troops uh, joined um, the attack on Russia. The, the Hungarian regent, uh, Admiral Horty, who was a who was quite an anti-Semite and, and uh, well, at least semi-fascist uh, ruler, uh, so certainly autocratic, um, had a deal with Hitler to, to, to join the attack on Russia. In consideration of which, uh, Hungary would be returned certain lost territories. This incidentally uh, had tragic consequences to my f family in Transylvania because whereas up to then they were under Romanian authority, when that part of Transylvania was returned by Hitler, the Hungarians came in straight away and um, started um, discrimination and ghettoization uh, and later transporting of Jews from those areas. Well, remember the Germans came in uh, initially as uh, allies, so that I do remember the German uh, soldiers about, you know, the, uh, but, but they were quite non-threatening initially. And I was at, uh, six and a half, seven years old then, and very much into military things. I'm completely obsessed. All my toys were uh, military tanks and guns and all that kind of thing. And I saluted all uniformed people, German or Hungarian soldiers. And, I, and they always saluted back. And, 
I, I was blonde, and uh, I had uh, had this comment from a German soldier. What a pity this boy is not German. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> Later on, when um, fighting actually reached Budapest, and then I saw German fighting groups and troops. And um, but but the general Wehrmacht soldiers weren't anything like as uh, discriminating and cruel as uh, the Hungarian fascist troops with the with the, the so-called Arrow Cross. That was the party's name, the fascist party name Arrow Cross, and they wore um, an armband with a with a crossed arrow symbol, which is which was their symbol instead of swastika, but it was just as bad. And one of my um, school friends was um, also the same age as me, uh, at that time seven years old, Yuri Ligati. He and his mother were caught up in one of these raids by the Arrow Cross, which were completely continuous and uh, arbitrary. You could be caught in the street or, or um, wherever you were hiding or anywhere. And if your papers weren't clear enough that you were not Jewish, you, you would be arrested. And a number of these arrested people, these groups, one, one group after another, were taken to a point of the shore of the Danube, which has a, a sheer fall. And that's where they were taken, lined up and shot into the Danube. And, and this friend, Yuri, was holding her mom's hand. Both were shot in. And her mom died right beside him and, you know, yeah. let go. And he was only shot through the arm and was taken down river by, by the river. Uh, it's a very strong current, the Danube. Further, further on, he sort of scrambled ashore. Maybe it was a path with, with steps. And um, this was overlooked by um, some people in adjacent uh, buildings and somebody uh, came down to rescue him and this little boy who, cry, who scrambled out of the river and they they hit him for the rest of the siege war and and he rejoined afterwards uh, and I remember that he was one of, he was probably the brightest guy in the, in the year, but very nervous, you know, obviously with post-traumatic post disorder. And um, I don't know what happened to him afterwards, I, I, I lost touch. One day to another, they um, brought out a law that all Jews had to wear a yellow star and I remember the family very gloomily sort of sitting together and the women making, sewing these yellow stars onto clothes and the children had to do, had to wear it too. I have a, an image here of, of a, a very good book on the Hungarian Holocaust. Um, which has a picture of a house with a yellow star. It's not our house, but it gives you the idea. Yes, I marked it. We, we had a yellow star on, much bigger than that, by the way. And um, one day, and my mom got very nervous and worried, and took down the yellow star one of the um, kind of nearby Nazi character. Um, he was in a Nazi uniform with the black boots and all shiny black boots. And, and he came to us. We were standing like this outside the building and said, I know what you've done. You know, don't worry, it's not going to make any difference. After um, 
the siege of Budapest, you know, and liberation, which was a very chaotic period. For a long time, we we were in the Buddha side of the uh, Buddha side of the Danube, and there weren't any bridges working initially. The Germans blew up all the major bridges, all the bridges. In fact, I remember the day when this happened. It was enormous banks, and and uh, we were in the uh, hills and could overlook. Um, the, the river in bits, but um, anyway, um, tragically one, one bridge had trams on it. It was mistimed, the actual uh, explosion, and uh, many people died because the trams just dived into the Danube. It took some time for the Russians to put together a pontoon bridge and then we could cross back. Um, we found our own old home in ruins completely, but rescued certain objects. Uh, the wall was completely torn down uh, by, by a blast, um, but the furnishings inside were there. And um, <laughs> we went up, the staircase on concrete was still working, and uh, my mum was, was uh, op uh, opening drawers and uh, cupboards and rescuing a few things here and there. Uh, and he collected it all up in one bundle. He said, uh, let's go for a coffee. And the bundle was stolen in that time. <laughs> this was the first time I remember my mom crying. Uh, the, during the occupation, she wasn't crying. She was very nervous, but I never remember her crying. But at that point, she cried. We were um, in in the Buddha Hills in in homes, children's homes, um, on false papers, kind of hiding. And my aunt was in charge, but we weren't allowed to recognize that she was a, a relation. And we had to call her different names. Everybody had different names and papers. And the actual fighting, the frontline fighting, reached our building. We several times had to uh, rehouse ourselves, so to speak, um, escape from one place to another because maybe the building was bombed over our heads, or you know, we were always in the cellars in those days. When the fighting reached us. Again, I, I, I didn't have a sense of fear, although, you know, we heard tremendous um, noises and, and bangs all the time. Got used to machine gun fire sounds and so on. But somehow I didn't um, relate it to myself that I am in this da in danger now. That on one occasion we had to, had to be rescued from one place which was shot to pieces to somewhere else and we had to um, go across back gardens um, and so on. And we were shot at. Um, because for the Russians, it was just a group of people in a distance, dots, and definitely were shot at. And um, I remember the sound of whistling bullets. And I wasn't afraid then, but I was aware of my particularly my mum's anxiety, as long as I was with them, you know, I got separated in, in the height of the fighting and so on. But in a previous period, when the Arrow Cross was raiding all over the place and my dad was still seeing patients occasionally, and um, I remember my mum being extremely anxious when he was a bit late coming back because there were rumors that there were again raids on the streets and trams and was he caught and so on. I, I am uh, aware of that, of her fear, rather than my own. Kastner was a, an influential Zionist leader in Transylvania, in, in, in Kolozhvar, Cluj-Napoca. Kastner um, came up to Budapest fairly late, I think, in, in, in the war. By that time, um, the Transylvanian 
Jews were ghettoized, and, and most of my family who remained there were. And, um, and I think all of them were transported to Auschwitz eventually. So Kastner came up to uh, Budapest and had uh, made contact with, with, with the um, uh, Jewish leadership in, in Budapest and he was a very persuasive and impressive guy and he had this project to save a fair number of Jews uh, by dealing with the Nazis and having a kind of business proposition to them. So he had a kind of independence um, for organizing this directly with the Germans. That meant dealing with Eichmann. He had direct or indirect contact with the SS leadership, Kaltenbrunner Brunner and, and, and um, Himmler himself. And, and the proposition was a certain number of Hungarian Jews, Transylvanian Jews actually, specifically, would be uh, saved, would be transported to Switzerland via Bergen-Belsen, a brief stay in Bergen-Belsen and on to Switzerland, in return for a supply of certain quantity of um, trucks, uh, military transport trucks, other machinery, we specified, and textiles. That was the original deal. Kastner had a, during these um, negotiations, very special status with the Germans. He was allowed not to wear a, a yellow star and had a kind of free access to the uh, SS headquarters in, in Budapest. So then Kastner went ahead and, and had lists compiled. To qualify for his lists, they, they were the, the, the sort of elite of Transylvanian Jews, the, the professionals, the upper class, uh, and the very rich doctors, um, lawyers, etc. So anyway, I don't know how, how the family got on to it, but um, um, my father and two uncles got involved with this, and so did we as a family, uh, extended family, to begin with. And that involved going into a Kastner collecting camp in Budapest, not, you know, not a very hard regime camp, but, but still a camp, um, surrounded by military, you know, p police and um, outside SS troops, etc. And it wasn't, um, the kids were allowed to play and we played and um, somebody found some clay in, in the courtyard and, and we were making objects and had a good time actually. <laughs> Inside there was Hungarian police, uniformed Hungarian police to keep order, but on the perimeters SS guards. And the guarding was more to do with stopping people who, who were not on the list joining than, than, than escaping. In fact, if you change your mind, you could leave this camp. And that's exactly what our family did eventually. After a while, um, my father and, and uh, uncles decided to go back to um, the Kastner camp. And they were indeed part of the last train. The first two trains, Kastner trains, had worked. My father and the uncles were all called up to be auxiliary sort of assisting the Hungarian army, kind of Jewish troops, with, you know, distinguished with, with a yellow armband, and to be 
taken to the Eastern Front to help troops, I don't know, dig trenches or whatever. Very often they were used to clear minefields. The survival rate was very poor. And so they had to make a, a decision at one point to, to allow this deportation as, to the Eastern Front or trust the Kessner team. Some decision. By the time my, my father and uncles were on, on the third train, Hitler got wind of this arrangement, which was until then conducted entirely behind his back. And he was outraged to save so many Jews. They all got stranded in Bergen-Belsen, but in a separate camp. And the Germans, uh, being pedantic, a deal is a deal. And they, were, they were treated differently. As, as hostages rather than captives. They, they were allowed to keep their clothes. They were allowed occasionally to receive Red Cross parcels. He said they were starving, but my dad was um, working as a doctor for that camp, the, the special camp. And, and as a result got extra rations, as well as there were cigarette rations, which he exchanged for food as well. He said, with all this and the Swiss, occasional Swiss parcel, and it all together is still starving. <laughs> they were separated from the main camp by um, barbed wire fencing. And you could see across the barbed wire what went on in the main camp. And he said it was unbelievable. People were reduced to animal state. They were fighting over a kind of soup which was only fit for um, pigs. They were fighting over it. And they saw capos beating people to death occasionally and stuff like that. It's an unbelievable. In Bagambas and they were in a special camp throughout. Then they were transferred to Theresienstadt or Theresien. Fam a very famous camp because occasionally they use this camp as a kind of show camp for, for visiting um, Red Cross potentates, you know, to show how cultural activities were, etc, etc. And then when the delegation went, they were transported to Auschwitz. You know, it, it was really a halfway house to Auschwitz, Theresienstadt. But relatively less um, severe camp compared to the others. You know, there, there, was, there was less or no brutality and so on. And that, that's when my dad got liberated. He said one day they noticed that there were no Germans around. And the next day the Russians walked in. And um, they were just allowed to, you know, go home if you want. During this time we had absolutely no news of whether he was alive or not. That, that, that was a very anxious time. And then one day he just turned up. <laughs> I remember. Um, because um, we were staying with my uncle since we were bombed out, sort of, uh, in our original home. And I was playing on the gangway. And in the distance I saw my father coming, you know, out of the blue, pretty much. There's no doubt that he was a collaborator. Because you cannot but criticize dealing with the Nazis in any way whatsoever, even for a good purpose. That was one thing. The other, that he was extremely selective. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that a lot of the uh, Zionist uh, 
leaders' families were in the transport, his own family and extended family, plus, plus the rich. If you weren't um, rich or influential or, or um, of the upper middle class, you, you couldn't get on the list. Th those people who were left behind were all ghettoized and transported to Auschwitz and most of them killed. Um, and most of my extended family had that fate. But one of the charge against him is that um, it was part of the deal with the Nazis that he should not warn the rest of the Jews about their likely ultimate fate in, in, um, from the ghettos. To... My family did not believe that extermination was on the cards. I mean, it was just too unbelievable. Um, I guess that his rationale for the whole thing was that if you can save lives, um, it doesn't matter with what negatives attached, then you save lives. And so I imagine that in, in his own eyes, he was justified. And uh, who am I to disagree when my father was p probably saved through this. But then you could say, well, that was life then. It was hierarchical and it was nothing unusual to have a strata which had advantages throughout in everything. That's when I was taken up into these children homes with them. Um, the false papers, etc. It was a villa taken and given over by um, a family called Hagemacher. They handed over their villas and other places for the purposes of saving uh, the Jewish children. This priest who was in charge and, and do, organizing an archipelago of places where, where kids were taken, all on false papers, was a, a tremendously um, generous and um, brave man called Stalo, who was a priest. And um, he was um, encouraged to do this by his bishop. The person who take, taken me up was actually carrying me in his arm. And we had to go past German troops, which had guns trained on the castle. But again, it wasn't a threatening situation. So then we were up there, and um, that was our first port of call. We went to about five or six different places because of the fighting that ruined the buildings around us. But typically, the Wehrmacht troops were too much on their minds. I mean, they were completely surrounded by Russians by then, and um, these these were their last days, pretty much. Christmas came, and <laughs> and we had an invitation from the German army to celebrate Christmas with them, because they were kind of homesick and missing um, missing their children. And of course, it couldn't be turned down. Um, and I remember very clearly this occasion where we turned up and there was a kind of a long, large hall of a place with a long white table, beautifully set, and, and a Christmas tree uh, at the end, and a huge flag at the end with a swastika on it. <laughs> And so we were seated uh, between German soldiers all along. And um, I, I don't remember any fear or uh, it was just, you know, uh, at last a meal, you know. <laughs> but the person in charge of us must have, must have had kittens uh, about this situation. Because the fear was that one of the kids want, want to go to the loo. And um, the racial origin would be revealed. Again, talking of Germans, another memory of the German largesse. It was winter time when, when the fighting was going on and 
all supplies were cut off. We had no electricity, no water. And people went out collecting snow to melt um, for water. And, and, and very little food. Uh, I mean, you know, we were living on spaghetti and, um, and dried beans, you know. And the Germans shot a horse for the population. And I remember pe people going out with buckets and carving bits of the horse to, to, to have some proper food for a change. I remember the horse goulash came out of it, which was very tasty. I don't understand why people don't like horse meat. All my aunts uh, got uh, jobs uh, in these children's homes, uh, <clears throat> but different places. Um, my mum was um, with a group of girls, and they all had kind of Red Cross nurses' uniforms, sort of. And that is a protection. The, the look was kind of um, a sort of safeguard. And they had a Red Cross emblem at the top and so on. In the most dangerous times, they were crisscrossing Budapest. It was incredibly dangerous. And um, on, on various missions. If they had been asked for the papers in one of the Aerocross raiding parties, that would have been it. Because of my background, and having suffered a great deal of racial injustice, following my visit to Israel, when I saw racism and injustice towards the Palestinians, that raised my interest to support that cause. I found that racism was extremely widespread in Israel. It affected even my own family, which I was completely shocked by. These are people who themselves had suffered. I, I remember um, particularly during the Intifada when Palestinian kids were throwing rocks. It was standard practice of the um, Israeli army that when they caught uh, children throwing um, rocks, they would break their arms as a, as a kind of reprisal. I mean, it's, and this was done wholesale. That kind of thing, you know. I mean, it was just so outrageous that. Uh, uh, the Palestinians deserved all the support they could get. We have had enough of oppression, of apartheid, of ethnic cleansing. We have had enough of settler colonialism. We have had it. And today we are saying enough. Enough with the crimes. Enough with the world complicity, and we are saying that as you watched only last night in Gaza, an entire family was wiped out in a shelter refugee camp. When I first visited Jerusalem, was still divided, and the way people were talking about the others, you know, the, you know across the fence, you know. The, the Arabs as, as a, um, in the same sort of horrible dismissive way that uh, extreme racism against Jews in my early experience or gypsies now in Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Romania. As, as a, as not um, equal human beings. And to have this from my aunt, who was one of these active persons in, in saving people, and, um, and a cousin who came back from Auschwitz, who had the experience of sorting her own parents' clothes in Auschwitz after execution. Guessing. They were horrible, horribly racist. 
about the Arabs and Palestinians. We were watching uh, a newsreel together and there was a Palestinian demonstration and Israeli helicopter gunships were shooting into the crowd. And I was absolutely horrified that this could happen in, in the 20th century, as it then was. And my aunt said, well, what, what's the terrible thing? I mean, they are Arabs. What do you expect? I was dumbfounded, you know. That was the initial uh, kind of motivation, that it was so unfair. And then Israel was militarized and the, the attitudes were just appalling. <clears throat> and, um, and then added to that what actually was happening historically, the, the, the fighting in Gaza and um, you know, the, the, the continual uh, victimization and uh, illegal settlements and um, so on. You know, the, the complete contempt for international laws. I think that Britain has a particular role in this, in that the Balfour Declaration has started the problems off in a big way. That we gave us some complicity uh, between the Zionist movement and Britain is one of the root causes of the present problems. Many commentators describe it as a tectonic shift in that you can suddenly openly say things that were taboo before. That it is a Jewish supremacist state and there is apartheid not just in the West Bank, but from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. These things are now openly said and are respectable to say, and that is a big change. But I think that when the situation seems completely hopeless, there are no specific ferments and developments below the surface that we think improbable today, and I think this will happen with Israel. I found that racism was extremely widespread in Israel. It affected even my own family, which I was completely shocked by. These are people who themselves had suffered. I think that Britain has a particular role in this, in that the Balfour Declaration has started the problems off in a big way. That imperious complicity uh, between the Zionist movement and Britain is one of the root causes of the present problems. Many commentators describe it as a tectonic shift in that you can suddenly openly say things that were taboo before that it is a Jewish supremacist state and there is apartheid, not just in the West Bank, but from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. These things are now openly said and are respectable to say, and that is a big change. But I think
that when the situation seems completely hopeless, there are specific ferments and developments below the surface that we think improbable today, and I think this will happen with Israel.